So now the second half, I just got the 15-minute notice, so I'm, sounds like I'm on time. I want to talk about some of the things that are very dear to me. Uh, two, two technologies that I've incorporated in my practice that have been, uh, I feel, very successful. One is the direct anterior approach for hip replacement, and this includes hip replacement and hip resurfacing. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on hip resurfacing because that's really geared to the very young, so the 40 and 50-year-old that need a, uh, a hip replacement. I do have an animation that shows it, and if anybody is interested in hip resurfacing, just come find me afterwards and I can tell you a little bit more about it. But when you, uh, I think it's safe to say the hip replacement has become one of the most successful surgeries of the 20th century. Uh, and the reason why it's successful is because it accomplishes the things that we try to accomplish with a joint replacement. It eliminates pain, it improves function, uh, it avoids complication, it is a speedy recovery, and it contains cost if we do it through a lesser approach. There are lots of literature out there looking at different minimal invasive surgeries. There's the posterior MIS, there's the anterior lateral MIS, there's the two incision MIS, and then there's direct anterior MIS. Well, how do you sort through all that? Which one is the, really the, the, the best surgery for you to have? And I'm going to try to make some arguments today why I think the direct anterior approach is such a good operation. When you look at all these studies that I just mentioned, there are different people that make different conclusions. Some of the studies say that minimal invasive surgery is quicker, has less blood loss, has a shorter hospital stay, has a quicker recovery, and no increased complications. Well, there's other studies that say exactly the opposite. There's no change in operative time, there's minimal change in blood loss, patients stay just as long, there's the same recovery, and in fact, there's a higher complication rate. And unfortunately, it is the peer-reviewed articles that have this conclusion. So why is that? Well, my th theory is maybe not all MIS approaches are created equal. And I'm going to try to go through all the different ones. There's the posterior approach or the one that goes through the buttocks, which most of the people have when they have a hip replacement. There's the Harding approach, which goes through the side. And then there's a bunch of two incisions where they make two little poke holes. And they've all kind of fallen out of favor because they seem to be very dangerous and very few surgeons can really do that operation well. And then there's the direct anterior approach, which we have started using about four and a half years ago. When you look at the hip muscles, these are all the muscles around the hip. And hip muscles have different functions. There's the hip flexors. Well, what do the hip flexors do? The hip flexors, they kick. They play soccer. Well, it's not that important of a muscle group because most of my patients don't play soccer and they don't kick at least not unless they get angry at me. So hip flexors are really not that important. The hip extensors, on the other hand, are extremely important. Those are the muscles you use just about any time you get up from a sitting position. Getting out of a car, getting off a chair, getting off the commode. So extensors, very important. Hip adductors, not that important. Hip abductors, on the other hand, again, is one of those muscle groups that are very important because they're the ones that keep your pelvis level when you stand on one leg. So people that have weak abductors, they're really limp like this. They have like a Trendelenburg gait. So the abductors are really important for gait. External rotators, again, is the third muscle group that is very, very important for hip function because they're the ones that keep the hip stable. And I don't know how many of you had a hip dislocation, but a hip dislocation is a very traumatic event. I get patients that ask me, how do I know that my hip is dislocated? Do you know what I say? Trust me, you'll know. <laughs> because they do. And it's a very traumatic event. And the external rotators are very important for the stability of the hip. So again, that's the third muscle group that is important. The internal rotators, there's really not a muscle that is a true internal rotatory muscle. And uh, they really don't play that much of a role, but maybe some slight uh, uh, ability to uh, prevent some anterior dislocation. So to summarize, what are the important muscle groups? It's the extensors, the abductors, and the external rotators. Well, let's look at the different approaches to the hip and see what muscles are affected when you do these approaches. With a posterior approach, these are the muscles that are affected. These are all the important muscles. So I think that's part of the reason why these patients don't do quite as well. When we look at the anterior lateral approach, or the one that comes from the side, these are the muscles that are affected. 
And it makes sense because the people that use the anterolateral approach, they use it to try to prevent hip dislocation. And you can see the external rotators are not affected by this approach. And in fact, in the literature, people with an anterior lateral approach have a much lower dislocation rate. But they limp for a long time because you have to take the abductors off. So they really limp for a long time. And even 30% of patients with this approach limp permanently. When you look at the anti-approach, only these muscles are affected. And I think that's the reason why these patients do so well.